Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you all for joining. These are one of the highlights of my month, having these discussions with community leaders. And it's really an honor to be here every month to do this with you. Today, we have Jeremy Prasad, who's also a childhood friend of mine. We're gonna be speaking on marginalization of Indo-Caribbean youth. We're gonna be talking about healing after incarceration and community engagement, and his personal experience navigating um, systems um, as Indo-Caribbean male. And so it's going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm so grateful for Jeremy for joining me today. And our Lord, it's actually... We're gonna wait for him to join. And while we do that, while we do that, I just wanted to always preface some of these conversations with the fact that some of these um, some of these topics can be um, can be a lot. They can be triggering. They can be healing. And so, in this space, we hold we hold space for all of those feelings. Um, and we hope that um, you know these conversations are doing great things for you and your family. Um, and so, like I said earlier, we're going to be talking about marginalization of Indo Caribbean youth with Jeremy Persad, and. Jeremy and I, we actually grew up together. Hey, Jeremy, I see you. We actually grew up together. And one of the things that I think is really important is to not only the trigger warning that I previously stated, but also um, the acknowledgement of these conversations being heavy. Um, some of these conversations can um, be really healing as well. So um, I love that we can come together and we can do this. Um, I'm going to invite Jeremy onto the live and before I do that I actually wanted to give a little bit of context so Jeremy and I grew up together um, we grew up in a marginalized community and um, as I say this I also wanted to acknowledge that Jeremy and I may be using the word hood um, to describe our upbringing and so I want to um, I want to ensure that that term um, we let go of any stereotypes, biases um, that we may have around language or um, our use of the term. We hold that term in respect and in integrity. Um, and, you know, remembering that there are real people here um, living in marginalized communities, racialized communities that are um, navigating really real issues. So in this space, if Jeremy and I use the word hood, it's with pride um, and it's with respect and it's with integrity okay so with that being said i'm going to invite jeremy onto the live let's see how i do this jeremy send hey jeremy hey how are you i'm good how are you doing doing good thank you for joining me today I'm gonna take these comments so I can see your face. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. You know, I see a lot of people sharing the flyer and supporting, and that just encourages me and lets me know that, you know, there's a real need for this. Well, I thank you so much for being here, Jeremy. It's it's a great honor to to know you and to observe the work that you've been doing in the community in village i actually get quite emotional when i see some of your posts just because you know you you to see that joy there is is really is really amazing to me and it's amazing to see the work that you've been doing there um and that just to contextualize the relationship jeremy and i have we grew up together we went to elementary school together middle school together high school together jeremy oh my goodness <laughs> so we've we've watched each other grow. We've been childhood friends. Um, I used to 
I used to bug Jeremy while he, while he was playing sports and stuff, while he was playing hockey. Like, let me play, let me play. I know I'm a girl, but can I play, please? Um, do you remember that, those days, Jeremy? I do. I remember, yeah, I used to, like, you know, kind of tease you a little bit, make fun of you a little bit. <laughs> you know, yes. but it was all a lot of love, though, you know? I know. I picture you being one of those guys. I don't remember, but I remember, like, when I was younger, like, you know, when you're uh, you're um, lining up for the assembly and there's always these guys, like, pulling your pigtails and, like, <laughs> touching you and then pretending it's not you. I imagine this was probably you. Yeah. Guilty. <laughs> <laughs> Well, again, my deepest, deepest gratitude, Jeremy, for you, for you and all that you're doing. Um, one of the things I remember also growing up is that your dad was, you know, the community pastor and he did a lot of community work um, within Village. So I can, I, it's really an honor to see you do your work in the community in your own way. So big up, Pastor Harry, tell him I say <laughs> hi, <laughs> if you remember yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, and Joel too. So thank you so much again for being here and sharing your voice. It's a great, it's a great privilege to be in this space with you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. I mean, I, I feel honored as well, you know, to, you know, be in high regards with you after, you know, all these years that we've grown up together and we kind of went different ways or whatever, but it's like uh, coming full circle now where, you know, you're doing big things for the Indo-Caribbeans as well, right? So it's just, it's just inspiring because uh, I always know that you're very smart and you're a very good writer and you always had the neatest handwriting. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's funny. I'm sure everybody would love to hear us talk about how much we admire each other and our childhood, but I'm sure they want to hear more about you and with your work and everything that you've got going on. And thank you so much for those words. They really, they really, um, I really appreciate it. But no to start us off, tell us a little bit about you, Jeremy. Like, who are you? <laughs> uh, so first of all, I also remember that it was your birthday not too long ago. So I just wanted to say happy birthday. And um, so, yeah, me, my name is Jeremy Prasad. A lot of people know me as Germs. Uh, I'm 32 years old, born and raised in Toronto. Um, I represent the community, the Lothathin community, also known as Village. It's in the west end of Toronto. Um, currently, I'm a student at Centennial College. I'm in the broadcasting, film, and television radio course. Um, I have a background in construction. I, I was working for like 10 years as a concrete finisher. I also worked as a table saw operator. And uh, I just had like a lot of ups and downs in my life. And I can say like, uh, I'm just at a point right now where I'm really turning things around because as I did have a height in my construction career, I also took a fall when I got into a little bit of trouble with the law. So, you know, a little things got real. But when I came out, I was inspired to just do greater things. And I started a youth program in my neighborhood called the Commitment Program. And ever since I started uh, doing positive things in my community, a lot of doors have opened up. And it's just been like the law of attraction with this positive energy. And uh, it's just been so good to me. And I just wanted to keep the positive energy rolling and just see what comes next. And I thank you for that. And I just want to validate that idea that you have about law of attraction, because one of the ways that we actually connected is through your vulnerability and your ability to speak about your struggles and what you've been going through and sort of your journey journey. So this is a manifestation of you being living in your truth your joy, your, your process and your journey. So I just wanted to acknowledge that and let you know that I see you and then a lot of people see you and timing is, is what it is. Right. Um, one of the things that I, you mentioned um, earlier was that we kind of took different paths and personally, I don't really think it was, it, it's like that. I think there's lots of things that go on, especially um, around how we're raised within some of these, some of our communities some of our family units. Um, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is the Indo-Caribbean males experience and that experience as a youth. So I hold that really um, close to my heart because I've seen a lot of, a lot of things and I, I feel, it feels like a really difficult journey for an Indo-Caribbean 
um, youth, in my opinion anyway. But I'm just wondering from you, what was your experience growing up as a brown skin, Indo-Caribbean youth? What was that experience like for you? Um, to be honest, like, I feel like it came with a lot. Like, uh, it was kind of like packaged as, uh, you know, growing up in a Caribbean home isn't always the most like simplest environment. There's a lot of family dynamics to it. Um, I can say uh, we grew up in a home that was like, I mean, I had my mom and my dad and I'm very fortunate to have that because I have a lot of cousins that do not have the father in the home. But I mean, there was a lot of uh, financial problems where we're always like under this feeling of poverty, which caused, it, caused a lot of depression and stress. Um, I grew up around a lot of domestic violence and uh, the home environment was very toxic. And, you know, just being a brown youth uh, going out outside of my house into the world, I felt like um, at times I was discriminated against. Um, I felt like I had to deal with a lot of, uh, you know, people were like picking on me because uh, like we grew up in mostly like a predominantly like a uh, black neighborhood, I would say. And, um, you know, so a lot of people would just tease you and be like, oh, you're packy or, you know, you're brown or like, you know, they'll make like these jokes or whatever. So like, I felt like um, also like with my dad being a pastor, like um, I wasn't really in tune with my Caribbean culture as um, he was very strict in the household and he didn't, um, he didn't like really allow me to like learn about like my Indian roots or anything, you know, because it was such a cultural divide with like religion uh, within the brown community. So um, I felt like uh, I wasn't really in tune with my culture and I felt like people from my same race wasn't always accepting of me uh, because like my friends were probably black and, and like just dealing with stuff like that, like my whole life, you know, it was pretty difficult. Um, you know, I've also been a, a victim of police brutality at a very young age. And I felt like I was just targeted because of my brown skin. So there was a lot of joys with being Caribbean as well. Like, you know, there's like big, large family gatherings. And there's always like these things to look forward to, you know. Um, and like, you know, we have amazing food. But like, I would say like, you know, it was, it was, it was challenging, not to say the least. Like, you know, like there's times where like I felt kind of ashamed of, of uh, being like Guyanese and stuff, you know, on behalf of like, you know, we didn't really have no male role models in our home, you know, like I had my father, but like a lot of my uncles, they'll just be on the block drinking and, you know, just making a fool out of themselves. And it was very embarrassing at times, you know, so that's like some of the stuff I had to deal with, I felt like. Mm -hmm. And thank you so much for your for your honesty and your bold. Really, you touched on a lot of things there: domestic violence, disconnection from from Indo Caribbean roots, you know, confidence. Um, and so, I'm I'm wondering, going a little bit deeper into the mentorship piece, like how how do you feel that how how important do you think it is to have mentorship? And like, how did that really impact you growing up, and how you you know navigated being being a man sorry i threw that question at you <laughs> yeah well honestly like i feel like that's very important and i feel like there's a lack of that you know like a lot of times like the west indian people they be just trying to make you drink or they're just trying to make you smoke all the time and it's like you know that's like their priorities i felt at times you know and i always knew that deep down i wanted better for myself and like you know i feel like uh there are no role models really, you know, that's why, that's why like as a male, I'm stepping up right now to, to speak on stuff like that. Cause I feel like there's not enough mans in my position or that are willing to speak up, you know? So, um, also like a lot of people are judgmental as well. Like, uh, when I have an experience like myself, like going to jail and stuff, like a lot of like, uh, older folks, are quick to like shut me down or shut me out, you know, they'd be like, oh yeah, this guy's bad or something, you know? So like, yeah, I just felt like there's just a lack of role models thereof. Um, you know, that's why I like big ups to my dad, you know, my dad was uh, probably the reason why I am the way I am because I always seen him constantly giving back. He had the Sunday school, 
he used to like give out yo-yos and stuff to the kids so like i see a lot of the stuff that i'm doing right now is like is because of my dad and my dad was literally like the dad of all my other cousins because none of them had the father in their home you know mm -hmm. and for real big up pastor harry even i am still i still see him and he's he's always there at you know funerals or and, and things like that and he's he's made a big impact on that community even still i remember i used to go to sunday school but i used to go for the candy yeah but still <laughs> but still just seeing him do what he has it's one of the places that many of our parents had as a space to heal and so in many ways you're creating that for village in your own way and so kudos to you and big up to you for the things that you're doing going back to sort of the indo-caribbean um, experience do you feel as though um, the Indo-Caribbean experience or the marginalization of Guyanese youth is sort of left out of the picture in the context of you know the broader marginalized communities like for example you know the black community um, do you think that we're left behind in some way or what are your thoughts on that yeah to be honest like we're like an in-between you know like that's what I feel because me growing up as Guyanese, like people would make fun of me and say, oh, you're packy or, or whatever. But I felt like I wasn't like that, really that packy, you know, or like I wasn't really like identifying with them. And then also like people would say, oh, you're not black. You think you're black. You braid your hair the way you dress. Well, you think you're black. And I'm like, OK, so all right, I'm not black. But then I had to realize, you know what, like I am these things, you know, I'm like now I find, him, I find it empowering being Guyanese. And, you know, now I love my hair. My hair is long. I, you know, I maintain it because I'm just like, yeah, this is a part of my identity and who I am, you know? So all these things that people used to try to spin around and try to, like, you know, try to say, oh, I'm not this or I'm not that. Like, that's where I was left out in a lot of things, you know? Like, um, there's a lot of support groups for the black community that I'll try to apply for and they'll be like, hey, but you're not black, you know? But a lot of my friends would be like, nah, you're black, bro. Like, you know, cause in some context, if I'm in, if I go to school and there's a lot of white kids, um, you know, like I'm technically black in their eyes, you know, so. Or South Asian, yeah. Yeah, so basically I'm just like, I just love our culture. I love the way that, you know, we, we bring like a certain vibration to the table. We're easy to get along with. We're very cultural. We're very big on culture, you know? So at the end of the day, if people want to make fun of me for and say, yo, go, go eat some curry, boy, I'd be like, all right, so what do you eat? Plain rice? Because I love <laughs> curry, you know? So that's what it is. That's what it is, you know? I'm, I'm, I represent the Black community. And I represent the Guyanese community, the Indian community, all of that, you know? And I think that's the beauty of our, our identity is that it's a fusion of all these different roots. And I'm curious to know, you, you went from a place maybe, it sounded like you mentioned that you went from a place from being disconnected to really embracing it. So how did that happen? Well, I just had to realize my identity, you know, like a lot of people, uh, they could look at me, they could judge me, they could say whatever they want about me. But at the end of the day, I am who I am. And I had to come into terms with that and just, and just look at everything to do with me as an empowering experience. Like, for example, um, like the disconnect came because uh, my parents were very religious. So they, they did not want me to listen to Indian music. And I didn't watch any Indian movies growing up. So I just became a product of my environment, of what I was around. And I was out here in the streets of Toronto in the West End. So in the West End, things are just a certain way. And I just, I got more received by the Black community in a way. So a lot of people um, from from our Guyanese culture, like I'll go to a party and people will just call me out and be like, oh, you chilling with the black mans or whatever, you know? Well, I'm just like, you know, I just had to like 
get in where I fit in. So at the end of the day, now I'm just, I'm standing up for it. You know, like, I feel like, why is poverty something that we struggle with when our country's natural resource is gold? You know, there's a lot of questions that I have, like, why are we in village, all the brown people and black people in this one square, and we go across the street, and everybody in the, in the big houses on Glen Long are all white people. You know, we had to go, our homeschool, we had to skip streets and go all the way to Lawrence Heights and Jungle. You know, why don't we get to go to Regina Monday or something like that? I feel like they already designed it a way to separate us from society. So by the time we go into society, we don't even know how we're being received. You know, we don't get it. We don't understand it. We just think like, hey, we've been around black people and brown people in this little box called village our whole life. And then we, we go out into the real world and the white people are just like, or not white people, but anybody in general, like, you know, they're just receiving us away. And we're just like, okay. You know, like there's, all, there's people that tell me I look scary. And I look at myself like, I don't look scary. I think I look good, like, you know? So it's just like a lot of people um, maybe they never been around our culture because they've been, there's no brown people in their communities, you know? So I just felt like there's just, it needs to be like some type of integration going on, which I see going on now in 2021, 2022. A lot of things are changing now. A lot of people are more accepting and things are getting more diverse. So that's where it becomes empowering now because I'm Canadian, but I don't look like that guy that they think is the Canadian, which is the white male, you know? I'm Canadian and I'm using that to my advantage. Like I'm Guyanese Canadian, first generation Canadian, and I'm out here trying to create generational wealth. And we didn't have no forefathers with a farm or a cottage. We, didn't, we never had that. We were in the hood. My parents started out in Jane and Finch in Driftwood. Driftwood Court. That's where my dad first came from, from Guyana. So that's like, you know, the bottom of the bottom, you know, and then he moved to village. So at the end of the day, like, now me, I'm going to do something else. And hopefully, you know, it's not even about just leaving the hood behind, but it's about elevation. So, yeah. And what you're doing is that you're, you're, recognizing this and you're showing representation of what an Indo-Caribbean man or Guyanese man could look like. And all your words here, I think is it's really powerful. And I think most, most recently there has been um, an influx of representation of Indo-Caribbean um, influences and accounts and people who are, are being loud and proud like you are right now. Because I think that, that was one of the things that I feel like I struggled with is that, you know, not all the time do you feel like uh, people who are elevated or people who may have a different life um, claim that the Guyanese identity for lots of reasons, right? A, a lot of them feel isolated from the identity. Some of them um, just, it doesn't resonate and to each their own. But I find recently now, especially like you were saying in 2020 and 2021, 2022, I'm sure will be even better. We're seeing a lot more representation and I just wanted to acknowledge um, the activism of Black people, Indigenous people, who we end up, um, our liberation is tied to the work that they're doing. And so kudos to them and all the work that they're doing to uplift marginalized communities. And I'm really happy to see that there are people like you, Jeremy, who are claiming our identity and doing the work that you're doing within the community. So I thank you again and I can't um, I think there's going to be a lot of people on here and that are going to speak your praise so I'm just going to go through the comments super quick and see what everybody is saying oh the comments were on fire holy okay so we got a, a lot of a hundreds yes shout out to the wonderful ambassador Jeremy yes um how do you, and we have a question here from Darius. How did you consolidate your feelings about who you are and your cultural background? I think you spoke to that, claiming it. Um, breaking generational trauma. Yes, shout out to Jeremy, community hero. Um, 
do you feel supported by your own community for the work that you do? Oh, that's an interesting question. Do you feel supported by your own community for the work that you do? Um, I feel like everything's going to happen, you know, like right now, I've only got gotten a chance to blossom within the past year. So now that all the efforts that I've been doing, I've been leading by example, and everybody's been uh, being able to see it through social media. And I feel like uh, a lot of doors have been opening for me now. So like people like you reaching out to me or the Caribbean network reaching out to me, these are opening doors so we can break these barriers. And like, I can not just help just the hood. Maybe we could expand this to anybody, you know, and reach out because um, I feel like there's a lot of people that need just like a mentor or a helping hand and it's very hard out here for these kids or these youth out here. Um, I'm I'm grassroots in the field, like firsthand experience with it. So um, I know that there hardly is any resources out here. And I know we're going to speak about all of this soon again, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so basically like I see firsthand like what's going on and a lot needs to be done, you know? This is just the beginning. So hopefully stuff like this will put awareness out and anyone could uh, contact me and holler at me and we could just go from there. And we, we're gonna all link up and we're gonna do something great, you know? It's true. And I, that's one of the, the biggest blessings, I think, uh, is, is that I've seen is that we're creating networks of Indo-Caribbean organizations and people that support each other. So that, the, I think the best is yet to come. So Chris says, um, yes, thank you for allowing us permission to reclaim our cultural identity in whatever way that means to us. Yes. And um, on Savoring here, we've had a lot of discussions around identity and cultural preservation and um, what it means to be Indo-Caribbean. So we have a few community leaders who we spoke with. So if anybody is so inspired to or, or feels like there's there's like a gap in how they feel around um, being a no-Caribbean. There's a few lives that I think will be super helpful for anyone who, who wants to check those out as well. So, Gary, you were mentioning earlier that you sort of, you know, got yourself, so, things went sideways, some way, somehow. And so I think this is a really vulnerable space for you to speak from. So I wanted to thank you. And I want to hold space for the fact that there's no judgments here. And I've said that already um, at the beginning. And I just want to, um, I just want to thank you for speaking so vulnerab vulnerably about your experience and all the things that um, you've gone through, because I think it's really important. I think this is one of the things that um, in the Indo-Caribbean community, we don't speak about. And because of that, it perpetuates cycles that really we need to start breaking. So I thank you for that, um, for, ha for trusting me and being here with me to speak about that. And so the first question I have for you is like, things happened. And so, um, you know, you, you came out. And so I'm, I'm wondering what that journey was like for you, because I've been a part of some of the, some of your conversations that you've had with other community organizations. And I've been, I've been really inspired. Um, and I, and I would love to, for you to share a little bit more about that experience. Yeah. So, yeah, I went through, I went through some, some experience. I'm not going to say what it was, you know, but at the end of the day, like, say if I had a lot of money, I could have busted up and beat it, you know, but at the end of the day, like I went, I was, a, I was in the system, you know, and basically like the system is a broken system, which we're trying to advocate for right now. Um, shout out to the Toronto Prisoners Rights Project. Um, we're working hand in hand with them right now, trying to like speak up on these things because um, yeah, I went through something. I did my time. I came, I pled guilty. I came out and based off of everything that I went through in there, I knew that it's not the place that you want to be, you know, it's, it's very, it's a, it's a broken place, you know, it, it, it'll, it'll break you if you're not strong, you know, I was fortunate enough to, you know, go through and be blessed. And I met a lot of individuals that I felt like maybe 
this was destiny for me to go through all that, you know, because like basically for you to help people, you have to like be in their shoes. You have to know what's going on. So like I really went through a lot of a lot of things and because I went through what I seen and the things that I seen, that's how I know how real it is. So when you get that sense of reality, when the reality sinks in, you're gonna know like you know, a lot of you see people doing things, you're like, yo, bro, that's not the way. And I could speak on that because because like the system does not work in terms of rehabilitation or integration or any of that, you know, like there's youths getting um locked up at a young age, getting trapped in the system. Um, they put a whole bunch of restrictions on you, which is like a setup for failure. And a lot of people end up being repeat offenders. And it, it's just a cycle that keeps going and going and going. So, and when you're placed in jail, you're pretty much uh, guilty until proven innocent. You know, you're being treated like as if you're guilty by these guards and these oppressors. So, so basically, um, yeah, with everything I just said, it's like, you know, you're being thrown in the lion's den, only the strong survive. Uh, there's a lot of high cost and lawyer fees that you have to deal with. Um, a lot of relationships become strained. You, you'll you see, um, you can see like uh, your loved ones going through stuff and you're not there to help. So basically like with all that stuff that I've been through, it's the, it's the driving force behind why I'm making a change in my life right now. Because um, I literally feel like, you know, I have so much potential and I just want so much more out of life than, than this jail stuff, you know? And I won't lie, when I went through my bid, I became an inmate. And I'm not gonna sit here and act like I'm some proper, prim and proper guy. Like when I was in there, I embodied the inmate, you know? And I became this inmate. And I, I came to a realization where this is my reality, right? But, you know, when I, when I came home, I felt like I had an influence. I felt like people, I don't know if it's clout or whatever it is, but I felt like people, they were looking at me for a direction. And it was like, what do I do? I felt like if I really wanted to, I could have started a gang and I could have led people in the wrong direction. But instead what I did, I started working out and a lot of people see me working out and they want to be involved. And then after one person turned into three, then turned into five then turned into 10, and then we had a whole bunch of youth. So I said, all right, with this, let's start the commitment program. And, you know, basically, it's just like, once I started doing that, a lot of doors started opening up for me. And basically, it's just like, it's just amazing. Like, people started reaching out to me from all walks of life. Basically, when I was doing my thuggy, nobody was there with me. I was there alone. You know, I had to, you know, just go through that alone because nobody really wants to mess with that stuff. Like that stuff's not cool. Like at the end of the day, like taking care of your family, um, trying to, trying to, you know, progress and make it, make it in life and elevation. Like that's just really cool. If you talk to guys, like I know guys right now doing life, you know, and if I was to walk back in that door, they wouldn't heal me up. It would, they would be so disappointed, you know? So at the end of the day, the reality sunk in for me. And some people need that reality check and to hit rock bottom, you know? So um, maybe by listening to me, you don't have to hit rock bottom, you know? And I could save you from that. But sometimes you have to feel it, you know? Some, so I felt it for myself. And that's what brings me here today, like doing all this good work right now. Well, you're amazing, Jeremy. I just wanted to say that right off the bat that you know everything that you've said it sounds like you know it's a choice that you made for yourself and there's a lot of work that goes into making those choices for yourself so i'm bigging you up and i'm so glad that you made those choices for yourself so i'm gonna read some of the comments here um um thankful for having you join us that night at tprp we hope to keep working with you jeremy I'm a TPRP member and so happy to hear this talk. Hope to continue more work in the future. That's from Saruki. 
The yeah, Caribbean shout Network. out to Toronto Prisoners Rights Project. Yes, Caribbean Network says prisons don't disappear problems, they disappear people, yeah. It's not rehabilitation at all. First that first seven step says no, it doesn't work and it's the grassroots workers how how actually who actually care to mix all these issues and systems should be fixing. It's true. System sets you up to fail. So much truth to that. Yep. Darius says, get it. Um and then someone says, Yo, you're Neil's boy, eh? I don't know. Um um, first seven steps says, um, but you were a good inmate, still a role model. Um, Cindy says, reclaiming your culture. Hey, Cindy, uh, reclaiming your culture. Um, how, how parents inspire their kids today that are growing up to feel confident. Are there things you can reflect on that would make your experience a bit more different? So reclaiming your culture. How can your parents inspire? Their, how can parents in, inspire their kids today? that are growing up to feel confident? Um, are there things you can reflect on that would make your experience more different? So anything from your experience, Jeremy, that would have made you feel a little bit more proud to going back to the identity conversation uh, mm -hmm. to be um, Guyanese? Um, to be honest, like, like growing up, like I always wanted to fit in like I always seen everybody dancing and I couldn't dance, you know? <laughs> and I always seen everyone just having a good time and I always wanted to fit in. So, you know, like, I just feel like, you know, it's all up to you. If, if you're struggling with the identity of your culture, like you gotta go do some research. You know, when you, when you look at how deep the roots are and you start learning about your own culture, then you'd be like, wow, you know? So, like us as Canadians, like some of us haven't even been back home. So I only been there once, you know, and I feel like I'm so Canadian. If I went there, I would like buy fast food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. And, and, you know, I think going back to that, Cindy, too, there's so many um, and anyone else, there are so many accounts now that um, are promoting Indo-Caribbean culture. And of course, they're savoring the Indo-Caribbean. There's the Cut Last podcast. And there's also Brown Gal Diary. There are a whole bunch of networks, Indo-Caribbean Canadian Association. Um, if anybody wants to learn more or um, wants accounts to follow, you can see who we follow. And then you'll see a lot of great accounts that you can, you can support and um, kind of help you on that journey of reclaiming identity and culture. And there are a lot of books as well. Two Times Removed was recently um, uh, pushed out. Um, there's Cooley Woman, there's lots of resources. So um, definitely anybody listening, reclaiming culture, those are, those are really big go-tos. Um, what was it like to advocate for yourself, your narrative and your needs through the legal system and the correctional system to live a flourishing life? What was it like to advocate for yourself in the legal system and the correctional system? Um, like right now, I just, like at first, I won't lie, like I would not even speak about stuff. Like, you know, I was very closed. I would never open up. I would just keep stuff to myself, right? But I guess like one day, because um, I'm very spiritual as well, you know? Like, so I like to pray to God about things. And um, one day I felt like God told me, how are you supposed to get help if you don't ask for it? So I began like opening up a little bit, right? So I guess with me open, opening up and showing that vulnerability, I was able to reach people and my story really hits people. And honestly, it's it's a part of who I am as well. I'm very transparent, you know, I'm very real with it. Um, I'm not saying that other people are fake or anything, but, um, I try to keep it as real as possible. I won't lie. Like, I feel like all lies are on me. If I'm a community leader, I'm under this magnifying glass and, you know, I, just because of my leadership, I have a lot of young people looking up to me. So I know what it's like and the pressure's on and I'm not going to let these kids down. Like I'm not. You know, I'm not here to like, I can't be doing dumb, dumb stuff and 
supposed to be the leader. So accountability is a big deal. Um, I have a few people that do keep me accountable on a daily. You know, I have a support team, which is very, very key. You know, I have a lot of people that call me every day and just tap in with me. So like, like mental health is a big thing too. You know, you got to check on your loved ones every now and then to see how they're doing. You know, like a lot of times, I don't know why we're not driving to go check our family and they live in Brampton. It's not that far, guys. Let's get in our cars and check our loved ones. You know, let's check each other. Life is short. Um, when you live the type of life that I live and you have friends die at a young age, um, you start realizing that, you know, life life is so precious. So I've just been advocating just because, you know, life is short. We're not trying to spend our life in jail. And basically the boy them and there's informers out there that will just rat on you. And all they need is one rat and you're gone. So like, you know, just do better. If you know better, do better. You know, like even if you're in the streets, there's a lot of transferable skills. Shout out to my boy that taught me about that. And, you know, so, you know, we're just trying to change change the narrative, like, you know, going to jail is not cool. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you could be doing with your time, you know. And honestly, it's not that we're scared of going to jail. Like, you know, we're in there. We're good, you know. Like, it's not like we're we're shaking it. We're actually having a good time as much as dumb as that sounds. Like, we're, we're okay, you know. It's not the end of the world. But at the end of the day, that's not what you want out of life, you know. Like, there's no girls in jail and... I love my females, so. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. So going back to this um, change that you've made to sort of be more vulnerable, be more um, out there and asking for help, like what was that experience like for you when you started making those choices for yourself? Oh, pardon me, say that one more time. What was the experience like for you when you started actually ha asking for help? Because you were mentioning that's not something that you would typically do. Yeah, so honestly, I started by um, attending church services. And so, like, I was attending, like, these smaller groups. It was a more intimate setting. And I was very close. I didn't want to speak at all. And then I kind of went, I kind of felt like it was like an intervention. So people were, like, dealing with me, like, I'm, like, this guy with criminal charges. And, like, I need, like, all this prayer and all this help. And I just felt like, okay, like, you know, yeah, I messed up. But, like, I felt like some people were just demonizing me, you know? So it also takes the right person. So I met a young brother named Saran. And uh, I was going to this uh, Tamil church. And basically, uh, he he's a young brother that also was in the system and incarcerated. So I had some relatability to him. And, like, I started opening up to him. So as I started opening up to him, it made it easier for me even to see that there's good people out there. Um, coming from the environment that I came from, a lot of people, like, you know, they they love to, like, try to trick you out your spot or, like, you know, they're slimy. They'll, they'd rather burn a bridge than to keep a long-lasting relationship. So I had to realize that there's still good people out there in this world and, you know, just meeting people that wanted to help me and the prayers are so sincere. Like, I had, like, uh, little girls, like, that were, like, 14 years old just put their hands on me and pray for me, and they'll start crying. And, like, that sh that just touched my soul, like, you know? And so so basically, I also went to, a, like, a, a program called the Journey Group, and that was also at uh, this church called Global Kingdom on uh, Mark and Manelsmer. And I was the only person in this program. So I felt like, this program was literally for me. And I finally kind of got down to the roots of everything that was causing me to like, you know, I, you know, like when you're acting out, you're always blaming it on something, right? So I used to blame a lot of things on my family and my parents. You know, my parents, shout out to them. They're very good people. But, you know, they're loud, you know. You know, Guyanese people, man, they're loud, you know. And if you say, why are you yelling? They're like, oh, we're just talking. <laughs> you know so it was just the environment was just so like loud and sometimes I didn't want to be home 
you know, I used to just leave the door, slam the door and just go out into the world just angry, you know, and everyone I see, I'm just angry at them, you know, for no reason. And I just want to like inflict my pain on somebody. I don't know why, like, you know, so I, going to that, that journey program, um, they made me realize that I was using that as an excuse you know, I kept blaming out my parents or my family for why I'm acting all crazy, you know? And I used to, I used to be like, yo, I'm mad. I don't care. I'm mad. But nah, you know what it was? I chose to be like that. You know, at the end of the day, there's a, you have to take responsibility for your actions. So as much as like my family dynamic, whatever, I was still the one going out there and acting out and doing whatever I was doing. Right. So, so you know, going to that program really taught me about myself. The first step was apologizing to my parents. So I sat them down one day. We had, like, some coffee. And I just told, like, my mom and my dad, like, yo, I'm so sorry. Like, you know, I'm sorry. You know, it was it was a very intimate moment. And a uh, part of being sorry is, uh, you know, you have to, like, put the stuff behind you. You can't bring it up again, you know? So I just made that choice in my life that I wasn't going to bring up the past no more, you know? I'm like, we're going to just move on from today forward, and I forgive you guys, and we'll never, I'm never bringing it up again to you guys, you know? Like, let's just keep going. And, like, yeah. honestly, that was a big healing and turning point in my life for me. That's amazing, Jeremy. And you know what? It's it's interesting because Indo-Caribbean families, we don't have that vulnerability sometimes with our parents. And so for you to make that choice to do that is quite a big step. And I think you, you touched a lot on what the different things you did for yourself, for your healing. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything else you want to share that's important to you to say today about, you know, healing after, you know, your incarceration and where you are now in terms of some of these um some of these personal choices you're making any other um, advice on healing um yeah i say like for healing that must mean that you're pretty broken so i must say that yeah i went through so much stuff that i'm traumatized you know there's some ptsd there um you know a lot of it a lot of what helps me is like my faith you know i believe I believe that, like, my name is Jeremy, and in the Bible, that comes from Jeremiah, which means the appointed one. Mm -hmm. So there's a scripture in the Bible that says, um, for I know the plans that I have for you. And it's plans to, I, I don't remember the whole thing right now, you know? <laughs> but basically, it's just like, there's a there's a greater purpose for me, you know? And I believe in that. And a part of the healing is like, you know, like I have issues sleeping. I remember we spoke about that as well. And, you know, so self-care is very important. I must say that. Um, like, and what are you doing for your self-care? Honestly, like going for long walks. Like I have two dogs. So every day I go for like long long walks and I just kind of think to myself and go through all my thoughts um working out is another thing exercising um kind of letting it out um shout out to my boy the first seven steps he's like one of my mentors uh because like guys like us like we don't go to therapy like like I never been to a therapist or a therapy session ever in my life you know I think, like, the only therapy we get if, like, we're smoking a blunt with our friend and we're talking, <laughs> you know? So I just feel like, um, you know, because there's no real therapist that looks like us or that can identify with our struggles. So I feel like when you go there and you just kind of make a fool out of yourself, you kind of just tell them all, all, the, all of whatever, and then they kind of just want the paycheck and tell you, all right, we'll come back next week, you know? So I feel like maybe... uh by me speaking out maybe we could start start that or find people that are relatable that could be the therapist because you know we need that some people just need to vent like i have a lot of friends right now on house arrest and ankle bracelets that are looking at time and sometimes they just want me to go there or or just to call them just for them to vent 
a lot of us just want to like just get some stuff off our chest you know so so healing is a big a big thing uh you know for self care also like like I was working and going to school I was trying to be superman I, you know so I had to stop working cuz I had to realize that my sleep is very important and my rest you know so it's just like healing the healing process is not done yet like you know I feel like I'm very damaged from it and like music is another thing that helps me you know I love listening to music it just puts me in like a good mood so like you know I want to I want to start traveling and going places I just been in literally in the marginalized neighborhood for my whole life <laughs> <laughs> Those are yeah. amazing. And, and you know what I think? It's a process of going through this, um, this thought process of realizing we're deserving of that self-care. We're deserving of that time for ourselves. We're deserving of putting ourselves first. And I'm so glad that you're doing that. That's what it sounds like, with, especially with the sleep. I know we talked about sleep when we reconnected. Yeah. Um, and the walks and everything. I think that's so amazing that you are taking that time to do that for yourself on a regular basis. Because I don't know about you, but it takes a lot daily. Like the self-care thing isn't like a cute little bubble bath for one time. Like it's a daily practice, regularly prioritizing yourself. And for anyone that's listening that may be looking for mental health resources, it's true that there aren't a lot of people that look like us and it's quite a privilege um, to be able to afford good therapy. There's two accounts, Dr. Samosa, Dr. Shane, Shema or Shana. Um, you can find them if you go through our followed list that speak from an Indo-Caribbean lens. So I just want to put that out there for anyone who may need it. Um, so I just wanted to plug in something there too, because on Friday we're doing a an event for mental health, um, men's mental health awareness. It's going to be at Caledonia and Eglinton from the hours of five to eight p.m. And it's just a place where like a bunch of a bunch of us men that are just going to get together. We're gonna just have an opportunity to chat. You know, you can share your 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 problems, or you can just talk to someone, or you or you don't have to. You can just listen to some music, just chill. But you know, it's a good place to network. And yeah, I just wanted to plug that in. Mm, I'm so glad you mentioned that. And be sure to send us any information on that. I could post it up on Savoring as well. Um, and I think it's super cool that you ha you're gonna have. It's gonna be a healing space for men, and I think men. Men, men's, men's mental health needs a special a special lens. And I think one of the things is, um, you know, these community spaces for just men to do what they do, whatever you guys do. <laughs> um, so um, just um, piggybacking a little bit about community and, you know, the need for community. Uh, I hope I sung your praise enough when I say thank you so much for the work that you're doing within the community. And so I'm, I'm curious for, from you, when it comes to community engagement, um, what, what, how important do you think that community work, community activities, these sorts of things, how, import, how important do you think they are actually to the community in terms of uh, their supports for youth? Um, I'm going to say this. The support is huge. We need support because do you know how much support there actually is? Because there's probably like hardly any. Um, I'm like I said earlier, like I'm out actually out here. Um, like uh, my my role right now, I just I just assume the leadership role in my neighborhood uh, because there's an absence of one, and basically there's there's really no hope for these kids. Like there's no community centers. There's nowhere for them to go. Um, there's no, not enough leaders. Um, right now, gun violence is at an all-time high. Um, I feel like uh, even even the people that are facilitating these programs, sometimes they're not even that equipped to deal with these youth that are coming from these communities. Um, these aren't your average youth. These are youth coming from broken homes. These are youth that are dealing with poverty. 
these are youths that um, are dealing with a lot of depression, anxiety. So like it takes someone from the area to kind of help these kids because they're not going to listen to somebody that looks like privileged, you know, like, do you understand our struggles? Cause you know, a lot of, a lot of people that do facilitate the programs, they come through, they, they just kind of like, you know, do what they got to do. And then they're out, you know, um, we've been trying to, we've been trying to like apply for grants and stuff. Like everything's in the works, but, um, this summer, uh, I just noticed the year going by without anything. And it was like really hurting me in my heart. You know, I literally went, out of my own pockets and put on for my hood this year to do the basketball tournament. So I felt like, you know, not every time I'm going to be able to afford that to do that. I was fortunate enough to have a good job this summer that I was able to put on. But, you know, without, without that, what I just did, there would have literally been nothing for the kids for the entire summer. And like COVID is a big deal, a big factor in that as well, where, I was trying to like uh, do things for my program, but uh, we're not able to have an indoor space for it. So during the winter, it's very cold. Um, there's nowhere for the youth to really go. So I just feel like we need support. Like right now, I'm on the front lines doing community work. I'm putting myself out there very vulnerable. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that could judge me, look at me like maybe I shouldn't be a leader because I have a past or whatever. And, you know, so it's very discouraging when we have no support. There's no money. There's no there's no uh, rec rooms. There's nothing. There's like absolutely nothing. Mm -hmm. So what would be your recommendation for anyone wanting to get involved and support some of your causes? What's the best way to support you? So right now, like. I appreciate everyone that's reaching out to me because right now there are actually a lot of things in the works so mm -hmm. that we can do things better the next, the next go around. Um, if anybody wants to reach out to me, you could just DM me and we could start talking right now. I'm a part of uh, this group called the collective group. Uh, we're like a bunch of community leaders from a lot of different communities. So like, even though I represent the village community, I also represent the Eglinton West community, the Lawrence Heights community, the community down on Jane Street, Weston Road, uh, Jane and Finch, Rexdale, everywhere, you know? So I'm not like just trying to like close it down to just my neighborhood only because like there's a big need for this in the whole city of Toronto. Um, there's a lot of communities in Toronto and there are a lot of people that are getting help and there's, it's just people don't know where to get the help. So I want to create like some type of a center or like a resource hub where people can get connected to the resources because a lot of times the government is giving grants and they are giving, giving uh, support, but we just don't know how to get it. So, you know, I see Liana in the comments. I want to shout her out as well because she does a lot of big stuff for the Eglinton community. And she tags me along in everything and makes sure that I'm involved as well. So um, basically right now I'm leading by example. I'm doing, I'm doing things. Um, I'm doing so much things right now and I want to do more. Like this is something that I'm so passionate about because if we do not reach these youth now, like they could get lost in the system and it's a never ending cycle. And I see these youths every day, um, they're wearing poo shiesty masks and side bags. It's not good. Like, you know, they're obviously they're influenced by the hip hop music. Um, you know, right now there's like um a lot of a lot of like drug drug influences in the music where um, you know, like sipping lean or popping perks and all these things are, are looking cool in the rap music, but you know, little did these kids know that those are opiates and you can get addicted, such like heroin, and your body builds a dependency on it. So we need, like, more people to, like, we need more education on these type of things. Like, when you go to school, they do not teach you about financial literacy. They don't really teach you about nutrition like that. They don't really teach us about our rights. So basically, that's why I want to make this program so 
we can have all these youths knowing what their rights are and everyone can know like um, how to eat healthier stuff. And basically we have to make better life choices in a whole. And we need to connect uh, anyone that needs jobs with jobs because, you know, like it's very discouraging to work minimum wage and put on those steel toe boots and, and work for an agency job, which is like most people in the marginalized areas, those are the jobs that they're getting, you know? So if we could just uh, bridge that gap where we can start uh, creating jobs and not just like minimum wage paying jobs, but like good paying jobs. So you can actually, you know, just go to work and focus on your family. If, if you're barely making ends meet, you still got to do something to survive. A lot of these people that are going to jail, they're coming out with nothing. And basically they're starting from scratch, having to figure it all out. And a lot of them are turning to crime just to maintain. And basically that's so backwards, you know? So, so like as much support as we can get, like hopefully someone's watching and this, you know, like motivate someone to like, to jump on board with me, you know? Cause sometimes it's discouraging um, I'm here doing things, trying to do the most, and, like, there's no help, you know? So, basically, yeah, man, like, anyone trying to get on board, let's do this. Um, and, yeah, we're starting to do, like, these workouts at Lakeshore every Sunday. Um, you know, we're just trying to do big things in the community. Like, we don't want just, like, little things. Like, when I when I did my basketball tournament, I didn't buy cheap prizes and stuff, like, I wanted people to go home feeling like, yeah, they got something great, like, and, you know, so they can come out next year. So, yeah, there's a lot of poverty going on. There's there's a lot of hopelessness. There's a lot of brokenness. Um, we need we need help. We need as much help as we can get. You know, like there there should be a lot more help, even in these communities more than ever because. You know, there's no turning back. Like, once your life is gone, once your life is lost, there's no coming back. And it affects people so much. Like, have, if you ever lost a loved one, it's it's hard to just, like, not do nothing about it. So there's a lot of people out here that are seeking for revenge. And, and, they're, and hurt people hurt people. So, you know, we just want to just change that. You know, we, we need – if people are getting money and they wouldn't need to do crime – to get money like they're having a good paying job or like you know connecting kids to education like we live in a country where you can apply for OSAF and you can just get a grant and your your class can get paid for it so you know we just need to connect these things we need to connect these things that are available to the people that really need it and not the people that go to school to skip school but the kids that you know you might see somebody tell you yo they're interested in, in um, making music and there's no place for them to make music. Like we need to create like studios for anyone that wants to make music so they can tap into their creativity, you know? Um, there's a lot of talent that's gone wasted, you know? So yeah, anything I could do to help, I'm gonna be doing, doing to help. I'm on the front lines with it. Um, you know, I'm just taking a stand um, people might try to come assassinate my character, but at the end of the day, like, there's a reason why I'm in this position because, like, I feel like I'm built for it tough, you know? Yeah. I, I went through the struggles. I went through in the lion's den, and I came out without a scratch. So, you know, there's a reason why I'm here today, and, yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that's important for me to always validate for you is how amazing this you are and everything that you're saying right now. I'm sure the comments are always going on fire. Um, so I want to personally tell you, Jeremy, that if there's anything I can do, anything that Savoring the Indo-Caribbean can do, um, I'm connected within the Indo-Caribbean community and community leaders. So. I will do my part in supporting you however which way you need it and um, anyone else on this live that feels like um, they have something that they want to share. Savoring is always open to ensuring that the word gets out because I think one of the things that resonates with me that you said was there are there can be resources and there can be support and there's people that need it and then 
there's this big gap between who gets it and how they can be accessed, where they can access it. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest things I think that are that's in our control that we can try to figure out is how do we connect people with the resources that they need if they're out there. I want to, uh, the first seven steps says he was trying to steal prizes. <laughs> He also said, uh, where did it go? He also said, you need your own TED Talk, which I agree. Um, uh, minimum wage jobs, you always have to have a side hustle to survive. Yeah, and that's the thing, right? So many, so many families, so many individuals are struggling to survive that they can't properly thrive. And so that's why it's so important to have community leaders like Jeremy who are doing the work and if there's anyone here, please, I encourage you to connect with Jeremy and to reach out to him um, with anything that, any supports that you can, you can have or you can offer. I'm sure he's going to be more than willing to see how he can connect the dots there. And Jeremy, that's a lot of pressure for you too, to be this, to be this like role model for everyone and doing all the things. So I just want to, um, to just stress, and I've said it already a hundred times to you before, but take care of yourself, of course, and to, and make sure that you are also thinking about yourself and what makes you happy, because that's a lot of it's a lot of pressure. I think as as community leaders, um, it, it's a lot of pressure to put on our, our, put on ourselves to always do it all. So I'm glad that we talked about self care <laughs> and the ways in which that you know you're taking care of yourself. So to wrap things up, I'm, I have two last questions, but just to summarize any events or any projects that you're working on that people can connect with you. We kind of like, it was kind of sporadic, but to summarize it, what are, what are some events or projects that we can look forward um, to from you? Okay, so you know, like I, my last event that I did was the Village Three on Three basketball tournament. So we can look forward to doing another one next year. Um, like I said, on Friday, we have the Men's Mental Health Awareness. Um, I'm working with the Toronto Prisoners' Rights Project right now. Um, we're just trying to advocate for, for prisoners. And um, I'm also working with the collective group. So um, they're doing big things in the community as well. Um, I'm also connected with the uh, Caribbean Network Ambassador. I'm trying to like uh, connect these programs. They have a good financial literacy program right now that uh, is offered through Zoom that any, uh, any youth that want to get connected with that, we could do that. Um, my, next, my next big project that I'm doing is a give back to Kenya. So mm. I'm trying to... Uh, my my boys over there right now trying to situate things down there to make sure that this stuff is going to go to people who actually need it. And we're trying to just uh, give them not just like our old clothes, but we're trying to give them like kitchen appliances and a little electronic gadgets that, you know, we take for granted, you know, like the egg beater or like a toaster or like a, maybe an air fryer, you know, these are things that we just take for granted that they could really need. Um, Right now, also, like, I wanted to shout out a few of my artists out there. Um, my boy, Sir Travis Knight, uh, look out for him. My brother, Joe Easy, uh, big up to Robbie Khan. Uh, shout out my boy, 4 or 5. He's a new upcoming artist as well. Um, I'm just, like, very involved in community right now. And, like, with all that being said, I'm still in school. So, like, uh... Right now, with the whole self-care thing and everything I'm doing, I still have to remember to put myself first, and I have to put my education second because I have to put my health first, you know? Um, not too long ago, actually like a week ago, I was in the hospital for some things that I'm going through right now internally, so... You know, basically, there's a lot going on, you know, there's more than meets the eye, you know, so everybody check in with your loved ones, you know, just call them, see how they're doing. And, you know, thank you to everybody that calls me and checks on me. I have a big support group, I can't lie. And my support only started 
when I started to do great things. So this is the law of attraction, positivity. I encourage everybody to just try it, just try to be positive, just try to like, you know, help others. And, you know, if that's not what you do, then that's cool too, you know, just, you know, let's just try try to be better versions of, of ourselves, you know? Amazing. Thank you, Jeremy, for sharing that. I think it's quite encouraging. And I love that you said that you're putting yourself first. And I think that's something, you know, with, um, with Indo-Caribbean people, people from marginalized communities, that is a journey to figure out how to do that. Um, and so I'm glad that that's something that you're prioritizing for yourself. So before we end off, Jeremy, with all the amazing things that you do, first of all, I just want to thank you so much for everything that you do and all the words that you've, you've shared with us. I think there's going to be a lot of people that will rewatch this conversation and feel so inspired by you. Um, and before I ask my last question, let's shout out some people that we know on here. We have Stephanie Narayan on here. Sharice Crooks is on here. Who else is on here? that we went to school with. Um, your brother's on here, of course. Leanna's on here. I think we went to high school together, if I'm not mistaken. So thank you all, that's all of you on here that are here with us and supporting our, our conversation here. Wish we could see you guys, but it's nice to see you in the comments. Uh, Vinay is on here now too. He just, <laughs> he just arrived, I think he had another event. Um, but thank you all so much for being here and so, Last words, Jeremy. So my question for you is, from, from a male's perspective, if there's anyone struggling with mental health, um, they're trying to change course in their life, um, they don't want to be judged for the one thing they did that one time, um, what's your advice for them? Um, to be honest, it's not easy. Um, it, it wouldn't be fair to just answer that with, just a simple answer you know like you have to really put yourself in somebody's shoes and um anxiety and depression and mental health and ptsd these are real things it's hard for me to even explain what i feel when i feel it um i feel like um like everybody in my community are they're not just your average they're not just your average people. People are are coming from broken homes. Um, people are coming from a hurt place. So uh, it's a lot more than meets the eye. I feel like uh, a lot of it too is you have to want the change within yourself. You have to like look for help as well. You know, like the help isn't just going to like fall in your lap all the time. So how bad do you want it? So whoever's listening, like, how bad do you want it? You know, like, a lot of us are suffering. It's just, like, your resilience, like, how you get back up, you know? It doesn't matter what you, what you go through, you know, because somebody else is going through something probably even worse. So, you know, just just keep your head up. Everybody just know, like, one one person told me this, this guy that, that was doing life. He was like, inhale, exhale, your problems are petty. So just always know that somebody is going through something. And if anybody like is suffering from mental health or they feel like they want to reach out to me, like you can reach out to me too. Like if you, cause like I'm a really cool guy. Like I'm very relatable. I'm very down to earth. Like, and I'm not going to judge you. Like, I've been through the most. So, like, a part of even me being here is, is like, owning up to, like, who I am and, you know, not caring about what people think, you know? Like, this is me. You're going to have to accept me for me, you know, because I haven't lived just a, the regular, like, average life. Like, I went through a lot of stuff. So, with that being said, like, I want to help. I don't want to help people that have it all together. I want to help the people that are the rejects, the people that people forgot about and the people that people are counting out because you know what? At a point in time, some people were counting me out. People were telling me I would never be nothing, you know? And I almost believed them. So 
I'm just like a testament of that because there's a lot of people that will try to oppress you and tell you that, yo, you know, like I'm, I'm going into the film industry right now. I'm taking, I'm in the film school. A lot of people told me, yo, you need to go get a trade. That's not a real job. You know, getting into media is not a real job, but you know, let me tell you something like the film industry is a very high paying, you get high paying jobs. Like, you know, so don't ever let nobody discourage you. There's a lot of people that are bitter and they're toxic or their situation is not like, or whatever. A lot of people want to look at you where, right where they can see you and make sure that you're right there and that you never surpass them, you know? So, nah, we're not doing that no more. We're trying to build people up. We're lending out a reaching hand, you know? We're just trying to say, everybody, like, let's let's rise up. Let's work together. Let's rise up. If you want to do it on your own, you can do it on your own. Everybody has their own formula. I can't tell somebody what to do. But if you want to make the change, it has to come from within. And maybe some people never felt the fire burn them yet. So they think life is a joke, you know? But I know life is not a joke. I've been to multiple funerals. I've seen my friends get buried. You know, I've seen people, my, you know, RIP to DJ Papa. I've seen um, my, young, my young friend die over a heart complication. So, you know, it's not just gunshot my friends are dying from. It's like just health problems too. So life is real. The reality sunk in for me and life is so real to me. And I take my life very seriously, you know? And if anybody needs some help or whatever, like you can holler at me. If I'm not the guy, maybe I can refer you to someone. I don't have all the resources, but shout out to my boy, the first seven steps. He's doing his mentorship. He's, uh, we're doing workouts. If you want to come through workout, you know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of things that we haven't, we haven't got it all figured out yet. I don't have it all figured out yet, but you know, together, I feel like we can come up with a solution. We can help people, you know, shout out to my, I have a couple of people in jail that call me every day. I'm um, going through their trials right now. And like, shout out to those guys. They have no support. They have nobody sending them money. They have nobody visiting them. They have nobody picking up their phone calls, you know? So just remember, think about others. Like before you think about yourself, just think about others because there's a lot of people going through worse than you. And, you know, like, let's just like, let's just get out of the small mentality, you know, like let's get out of that poverty mentality and that ghetto mentality, you know, that's, that's, that's like uh, manifest bigger and greater things, you know, there's words, there's uh, power in your words. So, you know, we got to start saying these things, like, we're going to say it, we're going to confess it, like, we're going to be rich, we're going to make it, my kids are going to live in a nice house, you know, I'm going to drive a nice car, I'm going to own multiple businesses, like, you know, we're going to just claim these things and manifest it before they happen, you know and just put the positive energy out there. And, you know, like, every day I watch the news, I see people dying from gunshots every day. I leave my house sometimes wondering if I could be a victim myself, you know? So I walk my dogs in areas that are very dangerous, but, you know, I walk with God. I believe in God. I believe that, you know, I have a higher purpose. And, you know, I'm not going to be a fool and just – and then just go places that I shouldn't go. But at the same time, like, I'm not going to let nobody make me feel scared and hide in my house. You know, I'm taking a frontline stand. I'm in the community. I'm, in, I'm trying to be a leader. I'm going to lead by example and just let my actions speak for itself, you know? Thank you, Jeremy. Honestly, I think that everything that you have said is going to reach someone, and I think... Um, this conversation is divine intervention. And so I thank you so much for being here with me, Jeremy. It means a lot to me for you to share so uh, vulnerably, so honestly, um, so openly with me. Thank you for trusting me to have this conversation with you. Um, I am cheering you on um, with my whole heart. And I'm, um, I want you to know that you have a lot of support here with Savoring the Indo-Caribbean um, in case you want to share anything of course we'll be looking out for all the great work that you're doing and so um, 
with, in terms of network, please um, know that you are supported by us. You're supported by the Caribbean organizations here that we're all connected with. And I thank you. Thank you so much for sharing space with me and sharing your time with me. I, um, I always say like all of these lives are, are so special to me. And this one was super special because it was with you. So thank you so much for being here. Any last words? Um, thank you for having me. It's a, it was an honor. Um, thank you for everybody that was tuning in. I've been reading the comments. Um, honestly, like, it takes a village to raise a child, right? And we're from village. So basically, I can't do it on my own. So, you know, let's just all network, connect, like, try to build something, a foundation and there's a lot of people out there. There's somebody out there that needs us right now. And, you know, we have a lot of work to do. So let's get it. <laughs> let's go. Big blessings to you, Jeremy. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Until next time, I'm sure this won't be the last time we connect. So thank you all so much for joining us. Jeremy, thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Bye.